Casey reporting on duty. Top of the morning to you, Tony. Good morning. The pears are very good and they're very sweet. Me, I like a nice red apple. I'd like to take an apple. Come to think of it, a pear might just hit the spot this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. See you later. Anybody here call a policeman? No, but I was just asking myself, who is that tall, beautiful man coming down the street? <laughs> oh, no, no, none of that. It's a little late in life for your old man to be going around looking beautiful. A beautiful cop, no less. <laughs> oh, dear, it's been a hard day, pounding my beat and walking and walking, and then finally to have a run in. With who? A little disagreement with the fella. You know, Maureen, I guess maybe the old man isn't ready for the groove factory after all. Of course you're not. <laughs> sure, and everyone knows you're just a broth of a bye. <laughs> I feel just as young tonight as I did after my first day on the beat 24 years ago. 25. <laughs> you have remembered, haven't you? I wore a shoe two sizes smaller then. Not that my feet are at all flat, mind you. It's just that my arch isn't as high as it used to be. <clears throat> Ah, this feels better. Now then, let's see what the Republicans are complaining about today. Pop, how would you like a hot foot bath? Who, me? Am I a rookie to have sore feet after a day on the beat? Well, I just thought you might like one. Well, child, if you're going to be offended, all right. It's just that I didn't want to be the one to use up all the hot water. You can call me when it's ready. It's ready. Hmm? Oh. Hmm. You're quite sure there's nobody in here? Yes. Well, for a wonder. The girls aren't home yet. I won't be home for dinner, Maureen. Who are you going out with? Oh, you don't know him. Jay, the fellow that said there's no place like home, really knew what he was talking about. Please hurry. You can't 
soak your feet all night. Uh, well, it's a fine how do you do when a man can't spend a few minutes in his own bathroom. Thanks, Pop. Yeah. And what's this I hear about a date? Oh, some fella. Some fella. Yeah. This thing's going to break someday. Hiya, Popsy. Hello, darling. How many guys did you throw in the jug today? <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> oh, no. That's enough of that. Let me go on with my newspaper reading. You know, there's some Republicans here who blame Roosevelt for the tornado in the South. Well, now, you just fix things right up for Mr. Roosevelt. <laughs> hey, Maureen! I won't be home for dinner. All right. Oh, so it's gone out to dinner you are, are you? Plain, simple food isn't good enough for you. Eddie's taking me out for a change, Popsy. Yeah. For a change, I'd like to have all my daughters home for an evening. What I'd like to know is this. Have I got three daughters or haven't I? Oh, boy! Oh. Have you got three daughters? Oh, now, now, none of your soft soap. You might just as well be living in an old man's home. Hey, Pop! Somebody's at the door. A man might just as well be living in the Grand Central Station. How was the beat today, Mr. Casey? Long. Say, Mr. Casey, take a look at our new business cards. Just run a finger over that. McCain and McElhiney records. You put it up and we'll tear it down. Tearing down things. How did you ever get into such a racket? It's a mystery to me, like how a man gets to play the bass fiddle. You know, Mr. Casey, someday we'll tear down the Empire State Building. Well, I hope you're under it. Patricia, will you come and take your young man? Hello, Eddie. All right, Pop, dinner's ready. Lord, beat us, Ed Peter. Oh, what a sausage, man. Pop, no reading at the table. I swear there's a conspiracy afoot to keep me from knowing what's going on in this country. Boy, oh boy, does that smell good. Would you like to have some? Oh, I'm not really hungry. Hmm. That's what you said the time you ate the whole turkey. Come on, Eddie, sit down. All right, if you insist. Oh, that's great. Is this your idea of going out to dinner? It's out to me. Oh, I knew I should have gone out with my boss. He wanted to take me to the symphony. Yeah. Hello, Eddie. Good night, Pop. Good night, Pat. See you later, Marine. That's for me. <laughs> Leave it to a Casey always to show class. That car looked like the 20th Century Limited pulling away from the curb. Was it a big yellow job? It was. But a nice yellow. And that was Joe Nicholas's new boat. Joe Nicholas? And what's my eldest daughter doing? Stepping out with a penny anti hoodlum? Now, Pop, eat your dinner and don't get excited. Why shouldn't I get excited with my daughter running around with a cheap gambler? Well, at least he takes people out to dinner. He's not like certain parties I know. Is there any telling what a man like that would take my daughter? Now, Pop, hold everything. Eloise has been around. She knows what she's doing. Hmm. Well, if she does, the more shame to her. I don't see anything wrong in running a horse betting place. What's wrong with running a handbook is that it's against the law. And no matter what you or anyone else thinks about the law, there's only a certain kind of a person who makes a living breaking it. You know, I never thought of it like that before. And that reminds me. I owe Nicholas six dollars from yesterday. <laughs> I sure bet on some silly nags. Oh, so you can spend six bucks on a horse, but you can't take me out to a dollar and a half dinner. Yeah, but you can't run a mile with a jockey on your back. <laughs> Neither can your horses. Pop, you don't have to do this. Go on back to your paper. <laughs> You know, when I finally did get a look at it, there wasn't a thing in it, except some Republicans complaining. 
I suppose you'll be going out too, leaving your old man alone? I haven't got a date. Why haven't you got a date? Well, that's my fault, I guess. Here you are, cooped up in the house all day, never seeing anyone but the butcher boy and the grocer and the man from the gas company. Now, Pop, stop worrying about my romantic life. If I went and got married, what would you do without me? And what do you think I am, a helpless invalid that I couldn't manage alone? It's your birthright to be married, and that's how I want to see you. And all I ask is that the boy you marry be respectable. That he loves you, and you love him. Don't I remember that your mother's father never liked me? He said I was just a rookie policeman and I'd never get anywhere. And he wanted his daughter to marry a man with a future. <laughs> Imagine him thinking I'd not have a future. And me 25 years on the force tomorrow. 25 years? Oh, dear. You know, Maureen, her hair was chestnut. Not that muddy brown kind, mind you. And there was none of that modern, thin, anemic business about her. No, sir. She was a big, strapping girl, with a spring in her walk and roses in her cheeks, and eyes as blue as Calardi's legs. <laughs> and there was I, a big hulk of a man with a brogue you could cut with a knife. Of course, I lost most of it since, but I had no words for anyone so beautiful. Finally, all I could do was to blurt out, Kathleen, says I, would you like to marry me? I'll never be able to give you a big house, says I with lots of servants and all the things a rich woman would have. But, says I, you'll always have enough to eat, with a roof over your head, and you'll have all my love. Well, she decided. And that night she went straight to her father and said in these very words, Father, says she, I've decided to marry Peter, even though maybe he ain't so awfully smart. Well, she found out later how wrong she was there. You know, darling, sometimes you'll make a certain move just like your mother. Or you toss your head like her. Or maybe you speak in a tone of voice that she would have used. And all of a sudden, it's just as if she was standing right there before me. Well, come on, come on, let's get on with the dishes and we'll play a game of casino. All right, but under one condition. That you don't cheat and get excited and holler. Now you are talking like your mother and you're accusing me just exactly as she used to do. I'm a sane, sensible man who knows that a game of cards is just a game of cards and nothing more. If I do lose 15 or 16 cents of an evening, what of it? I make good wages and I can well afford them. There's nothing to be excited about. Well, here, we're not going to get anywhere if we wash the same dish over and over again. Everybody in this house knows that I get up exactly seven o'clock every morning, and yet there's never been a time when I could step out of bed and get into this battle. I'm sorry, Pops. I'll try to do better tomorrow morning. Mm. That's what you said yesterday. That thing's going to break someday. Only your opinion. Now remember you two, no dates tonight. And no cracks at dinner in front of Pop. Let's make this a real surprise party for once. How many are coming? 24 if they all show up. Don't you worry, they'll all show up. Is that Gallagher coming? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, he found out about it, so I had to invite him. After all, he did come over on the boat with Pop. Well, if he breaks up any furniture tonight, he's going to pay for it. Remember at Eloise's birthday party? He threw a chair right out the window. I wouldn't have minded the chair so much if Mr. O'Shaughnessy hadn't been in it. Oh! That coffee's so hot you could boil an egg in it. Hmm. Hey, look! Look at that! 
What is that? Double talk? Mm. Now what's do it? Oh, pictures in the paper. Well, I'll be darned. Look at that, Maureen. What's going on here? Look at this handsome man. Pop, you're famous again. <laughs> oh, that picture. It's a bad one, isn't it? Oh, mm. never mind the modesty. Why didn't you tell us last night? Do we have to find out about our own father from the newspapers? Well, you know, I knew there was something I was meaning to tell you, but it must have slipped my mind. Slipped your mind? A gunfight and it slips your mind. <laughs> well, it didn't amount to anything anyway. Just think of it. Twenty-five years ago this morning, I had my first day on the beat. Twenty-five years ago. I've got to get going. And if you gulp down your food like that, by the time you are 30, your stomach will look like the inside of a volcano. Goodbye, Pop. Goodbye. And another thing, young lady. I don't want to hear again about you running around with that penny anti hoodlum Joe Nicholas. He's no good. And if you go around long enough with a person who's no good, some of the badness will rub off on you. Yes, Pop. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, gosh, I'm late. So long, Pop. So long. Twenty-five years ago today. Oh, dear. Top of the morning, dear Mara. Good morning, Casey. Congratulations on your 25th year on the force. Uh, thank you. What's this I've been seeing in the papers about you? Oh, the newspapers. Good morning, ma'am. They always make more of a thing than is. Nevertheless, I'm betting the big boy will be taking some notice of it. I wouldn't be surprised even if there was a promotion in the air. Ah, yeah, promotion. Do you really think so, Mara? I certainly do, and it's about time. It's not that I mind being just a patrolman, you understand. And I'm not going around bootlicking any politicians for promotion. No, sir. I've nothing to be ashamed of for my years on the force. And that's a sight more than can be said for certain lieutenants and captains that could be mentioned. Still in all, it'll be nice to have a couple of stripes on me sleeve. A good man always gets his due in the end. Right you are, Mara. Nice shooting, Casey. Ah. You'll be rating something for that performance. <laughs> You're a good shot, Casey. Thank One you. of the best. Casey, take Patrolman Ferguson out on his beat and show him the daily routine. There you are, Casey. What did I tell you? You'll not be pounding a beat much longer. You're a bit of a prophet, Mallard. Casey, this is Ferguson. He's going to walk your beat from now on. Ferguson, is it? Aye, Angus Ferguson. A Scotsman, I take it. Quite right. Only the word is Scotsman. No, no, don't go getting off on the wrong foot by telling me how to pronounce the English language. All in! Come ahead, rookie. I suppose I'm supposed to get it into your thick head in a day, what has taken me 25 years to learn. With the right kind of a teacher, it might be done. Uh-huh. Huh? All right. Now, what does your thick scotch head make of this store? Undoubtedly, it looks like a cigar store to you. There's a couple of cigars and a few packs of cigarettes in the window, so you say to yourselves, as you, sure, it's a cigar store. <laughs> and that's how a Scotchman thinks. If you're asking me, I'd say it's more likely a bookmaking establishment. Somebody must have told you. In police college... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. As you may know, I'm being promoted. And Scotchman, you better pray that you don't come under my command, because if you do, I'll be knocking that police college talk out of you fast enough. Hold on, hold on. That'll be a Scotch song, won't it? Aye. Aye. No whistling on the beat. Hello, Tony. Well, what's best today? The apples are the cheapest. In that case, I think I'll try a pear. Hold on there. A fine example of law and order you are, going around thieving fruit. Just like a Scotchman, trying to get something for nothing. But you helped yourself, didn't you? That's different. I've been taking one every day for the past 25 years. That's all right. <laughs> Give the poor man back his apple. There you are. There's the big boy's car. Wouldn't it be funny now if he skipped me right over the rank of sergeant and made a lieutenant of me? Oh, dear. Oh, and Scotchman. In spite of our differences on how to run the police force, you'll find me a very understanding superior.
Casey. The big boy wants to see you in the captain's office. Good afternoon, Casey. Good afternoon. Have you ever met Commissioner O'Connor? <laughs> Indeed, I have. Twenty-four years ago. Do you recall the occasion, Commissioner? No, I'm afraid I don't. Sure you do. It was at a police track and field meet. You and me won the three-legged race together. May I have the medal at home now? <laughs> <laughs> sure I remember. <laughs> Oh, uh, dear, you know, I often say to the boys in the station here, that's one time when me and the commissioner were as close as that. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly ran a great race that day, Casey. Uh, that we did, sir. <laughs> I don't have to tell you that you've been on the force 25 years today. You know, sir, I was wondering whether there was going to be any official recognition of the day. And I want to say right now, sir, you'll find me as reliable with authority as I've always been under it. 25 years is a long time, Casey. <laughs> I'm sure you'll enjoy a rest. A rest? Yes. Casey, I know you're in great shape. But no matter what you think, you're not as good a man as you were 25 years ago. Or even 10 years ago, for that matter. None of us are. You see, we've got a lot of young men coming out of the police college, and we've got to find room for them. Of course, I don't suppose you'll mind taking that half-pay pension check every month for the rest of your life while you take it easy. Well, there's nothing to feel bad about, Casey. Why, an honorable discharge from the force is something to be proud of. Oh, tell me there's nothing to feel bad about. Man, don't you see what you're doing to me? Here I am in the prime of life, and you stand me unfit for further use. I'm sorry, Casey. I know just how you feel. You've served the department well. Thank you, sir. When will my retirement be effective? Tonight. Yes, sir. You can give your badge to Lieutenant Finnegan. Goodbye, Casey. I think you could do another trick, or Ark's sake, and we're short a man. Yes, sir. The captain told me to turn this into you. Thank you, Casey. Ferguson, I hope you'll be just half as good as the man that's been wearing this. I'll try to be, sir. I'm very sorry it's your work I'm taking over, Mr. Casey. I suppose I had to take somebody's. That's right, is it, no? I'll thank you to offer me none of your sympathy. It's a bad day when a good Irishman will accept the condolences of a Scotchman. Mr. Casey, Scotsman, if you please. Whether it's Scotchman or Scotsman, it's all from the same cut of animal. And I'd like to know what kind of black politics you played to take the place of a good Irishman who served the force for 25 years. Now, now, Casey, cut it out. The boy got on the force through the usual procedure. And the police college reports him a very good man. Yes, sir. Police College. Casey, before you go, the boys planned something to celebrate your anniversary. Oh, no. They didn't know you were going to be retired, but it still goes. They bought you something. Well, hey, O'Brien! Men, we gathered here for a minute to do honor to a man who's been pounding a beat for the last 25 years. He's been a good man on the force. There's a couple of us guys here in this room whose lives he saved. Peter, you're going to be taking it easy from now on, you lucky dog. So I and the rest of the boys kind of figured that you ought to take it easy in style. 
Hey, bring it in. Gazing? From now on, all you gotta do is park yourself in this here swing and collect the pension checks as they bring them up to you every month. And if the guy that delivers them is as much as a minute late, give him the works for all of us. That right, boys? Boys, all I can say is thanks. When we're all out pounding the beat, have a good sleep on me. And don't let us hear about you getting out of bed before noon, either. Now, take it easy, Casey. And Casey. Take good care of yourself. I will. <laughs> We've arranged to have the swing delivered to your house. Now I think we both need a drink. Well, you'll have no quarrel with me there, Mara. <laughs> that certainly is a beauty, ain't it? Well, it is that. If I only had a porch to put it on. night when I need my family, I come into a house as dark and silent as a grave. What's all this about? Happy 25th anniversary on the force, Pop. And here's hoping you have 25 more. And here's something for you, Casey. Thank you, Scanlon. Oh, that's all right. And I hope you'll be able to use them on your beat on cold nights for a long time. <laughs> Strictly regulation, Mr. Casey. Get a load of that. <laughs> you won't find a final one on the whole force. That's very nice, Mac. Yeah. 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 25 years on the force. Mr. Casey, you don't look a day over 60. And why should I? I am only 57. <laughs> hey, Hop, huh. where did you get that? Did you win it in a raffle? That's my reward for being 25 years on the police force. And the boys gave it to me. Well, I thank all you folks. It's nice of you to come here and bring these presents. And I certainly am surprised. <laughs> come on, let's get the party going, huh? Come on, Riley. And play us dear old Johnny Gall. You can see what I'll be spending the rest of the night at the piano. I'm hungry. Come on. No, you're a little too old for that sort of thing. Will you listen to the man that's been walking the beat for 25 years? Oh, come on, come on. Oh, Step come into on. a kiss. Come on back and then come out when I ring the bell. You're not Casey. Here. Uh-oh, that sounds like Gallagher. Nail everything down. Miss Casey, how's your charming silk? <laughs> Twenty-five years on the force, and you'd never believe it, but they have to be. Uh-oh. Scanlon, lad. Oh, Mr. And Riley. Mac. <laughs> Keep the party going, boys and girls. Why, it's only once in a quarter of a century that a man has a chance to celebrate his 25th anniversary on the force. Oh, Casey. 
I heard today that Mac, by mistake, tore down the wrong building, and he's having the devil's own time getting it back together again. Gallagher, if it ain't asking too much, do you mind taking it a little easy tonight? If any bones are broken due to your goings on, I'm going to hold you to account for it. Since when do you have to tell me how to act? Oh, no. Have I ever been accused of not being a gentleman? It's all right. It's all right now. No one ever accused you of being one, either. Casey, tis awful lazy, I offend. But we just pretend that nothing's been said. So, Casey, have a cigar, and here's many happy returns of the day. Thank you, thank you, Gallagher. That's very nice of you. The man that gave me this to give to you told me that he wanted nobody you would get it personally. Now we're beginning to understand each other. I think you better get a good light. Music! <laughs> Good evening, miss. There's so much noise inside, I could hardly hear you. That's what I've come up to inquire about, miss. Some of the neighbors in the next block are complaining. I was wondering if, if those inside could quiet down a wee bit. I hate to be a bother about this, miss, for I'm pretty fond of a cheery party myself. But I have to do my duty and keep the peace. I understand. I'll see what I can do about it. Well, I've always said, either invite them in or throw them out. Don't keep them hanging around the hallway. Oh. Flatfoot, what did you want? I was just informing the young lady that there have been some complaints about the Koli Sheng. The what? The Koli... The uproar. Oh, the noise? Aye. Well, who are you to be telling us how much or how little noise we should be after making? Get back on your beat or I'd tear your limb from limb and pull your ears down over your shoulders. Mr. Gallagher, please go back inside. Maureen? What's going on out there? Oh, Casey, there's a Flatfoot out there begging your pardon. The policeman out here says we're making too much noise. He's right, and he's only doing his duty. Get back in here, Gallagher, or I help him to knock the dandruff into your thick head. Officer, you're to pay no attention to this. I... Oh, oh, it's you, is it? Aye, it's me. And I was just saying to the shop... I have no interest in what you're saying to my daughter, other than that I don't want the likes of you saying anything to her. Ain't it just like a low Scotchman going around plaguing honest citizens and them on simple pleasure bent? Pop, if you and Mr. Gallagher will just go back inside, I'll handle this. No, no, you don't. I know how to take care of thugs and hoodlums like this. A political henchman, that's what he is. Mr. Casey, as a former officer of the law, you're familiar with the ordinance that has to do with the keeping of the peace. You know I'm only doing my duty when I ask you to observe that ordinance. Former officer of the law? What do you mean? Ah, oh, the blatherland fool is right. They've thrown me out. Like an old horse put to pasture. Told me if I had enough to eat and drink. I ought to be thankful. Who did it to you? Who but the politicians? Me on the force 25 years and you on the force one day. And you're going to interpret to me the meaning of the ordinance about keeping the peace. Huh. A fine state of affairs. Oh, Casey, let me throw him right straight through the downstairs door. Without opening us, a fine splatter of glass in me. Now get inside, both of you. You'll have the whole rat squad up here. Wait. I'm sorry. You'll have to excuse Pop tonight. And you always have to excuse Mr. Gallagher. I can well understand how he must feel, leaving the force after all this time. Only he shouldn't I blame me just because I've taken over his beat. Well, he'll get over that. I certainly hope so. For it's no to my liking that the father of such a bunny lass should be down on me. Hurry! From me out of the hall and stop talking to that Scotchman. Mr. Casey, as I've told you before, it's not Scotsman, it's Scotsman. But if I was anything like it, I wouldn't go around shouting about it, you, you foreigner. Wait, what? Me, a foreigner? If that wouldn't provoke a saint. And you were a brogue so thick, you could blow it through the bagpipes, and it'd still come out Irish. I still think we should have thrown that Scotsman straight through the door. That's the surest way to win that argument. I'm glad I haven't got that job anymore. Nosing about the neighborhood like a glorified police dog, disturbing good people, trying to have a nice time in their own homes. I suppose now you'll be taking up golf, huh, Mr. Casey? I will. No, I won't. That silly scotch game. Not me. <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to hold the caddy.
Why didn't somebody wake me? Now, I haven't time for breakfast, and I have to pick up a cup of coffee somewhere along the beat. A fine thing. I might just as well be living in the subway. When you've been doing a thing for a long time, I guess it becomes a pretty strong habit. We were going to let you sleep, Pop. Tomorrow morning, I'll get all the sleep a man could want. Well, I'm on my way. I don't understand why you always have to eat your breakfast standing on your feet. Why don't you sit down to your meals like a civilized human being? Don't worry, Pop. Say, I'll have plenty of time to sit all day. Bye, everyone. From now on, I'm going to have more time, and I'm going to see that my daughters take care of themselves. This business of rushing through meals has got to stop. Oh, Pop, you sound like a Republican. Relax. Take it easy. You're a man of leisure now. And if you think I'm not going to enjoy it, you're all wrong. There they are, down there, lining up, getting their orders for the day. And here am I, luxuriating in the comfort of my own home, doing nothing. This is the life. I'd be a long time in Ireland before I'd get paid for doing this. Doing what, Pop? Doing nothing. Good morning. Well, what's good today? The oranges are the most expensive. Fine. I'll have one. Hey, five cents, please. Five cents? Five cents. Look, for many years, with your uniforms, every day and every week and every month and every year, all the ways are the same. You was robbing me. You don't make a sense. You were supposed to catch the crook and you rob him instead. For 25 years, I never have a trouble with the crooks, except you. Now you know, got no uniforms. If you wasn't going to rob me, I call the cop. Five cents, please. I don't like oranges anyway. Besides, you sell nothing but second grade fruit. Ah. Take it easy now, take it easy. Bone, you're all right now. Don't cry. You didn't hurt yourself a bit. Not a bit. In five minutes, you'll forget all about it. And then you can dash out into another street and get yourself scared to death. There, there. Now, here. Here's an end. Now, stop crying and get yourself some candy. But if you spoil your lunch, don't you tell your mother who give it to you. There, now. Run along. Run along. There. That was a grand thing you just did, Mr. Casey. There you stand, right under the corner, as big as life and twice as dumb, while under your very nose the children are practically being murdered. You stand there twiddling your thumbs. As you saw, Mr. Casey, I wasn't twiddling my thumbs. I couldn't have been in two places at once. And I was busy herding another batch of youngsters across the street. Well, if that ain't like a Scotchman. Mr. Casey, time and time again I've told you that there is no such individual as a Scotchman. Scotch whiskey, aye, but Scotchmen, no. I'm a Scotsman. 
and that to the backbone. And I say this, whether it's Scotchman or Scotsman, you're still a big baboon. And you shouldn't be allowed to direct a toy train. And if I... Pop! Pop, what's going on here? This big gorilla has practically killed a child. And now he wants to arrest me on account of it. You'll excuse me contradicting, Miss Casey. But those are no exactly the facts. I, Pop, will you take these bundles home, please? They're awfully heavy, and I have to do more shopping. I will, if it's only to get away from this guy soon. He talked the cross off a donkey's shoulder. I don't know what the trouble was, officer, but knowing Pop, I imagine he may have started it. Well, Miss Casey, it was just one of those unexpected happenings. Your father did a very brave thing. But as you know, nothing I ever do seems to please him. I sometimes think if your father got to know me better, he might get to think a wee bit better of me. I don't know. Still, I think if I had the chance, I could work around him a bit. Does he smoke? Yes. That's grand. I'll drop in to see you some evening this week and, and bring him a box of cigars. Well, I'm afraid he wouldn't like the cigars. Pop's awfully stubborn. Well, we Scots are a wee bit stubborn ourselves sometimes. But I'm determined to get on the good side of your father. Remember, you'll have to help. Well, don't. I'm telling you, it wouldn't work. Maybe I could break him down with a bottle of good scotch. Oh, no. Never scotch. Well, goodbye, officer. 7739. Goodbye. Oh, uh, Ferguson is the name, Lassie. Angus Ferguson. Well, for one thing, he broke a pile of dishes this noon. I haven't seen him since. If he keeps on breaking things while he's trying to help, we're going to have to move into a tent. Or get ten dishes. Well, if he doesn't find something to occupy his time with pretty soon, he's going to go crazy. And me, too. Pat, couldn't Eddie give Pop some kind of a job with his wrecking company? He might be pretty good. Look what he's doing around here without even trying. Don't be silly. Pop wouldn't work for Eddie if he was starving to death. Why doesn't he try to get a job as floor walker in a department store? He's used to walking. Oh, now that's brilliant. First customer that talked back to him, Papa Thor, right out of the store. Or try to give her a ticket. You kids don't seem to realize what Pop's really going through. All right, little mother. Well, what have you two been up to? Ah, we've been celebrating. <laughs> We've been having a few drinks to a house the young man's going to build. We drunk a toast to each room. From the looks of you, you must be planning to build a hotel. Patricia, your father's been taking a drop now and again for the past 35 years. It's a little late to tell him how to do it. Okay, Pop, you're all right. All right, everybody, let's sit down. Dinner's ready. Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you going to wash up? I wash at noon. I'll get it. Ah, Miss Casey. Then how's your charming self? I'm all right. But if I'm not intruding too much, is your father home? Understand now, if you sit at the supper table, I don't want to disturb him. Hey, Casey. Hi. Hi. Well, Casey, it is awful fashionable you're getting to be having your supper at this late hour and wearing a coat. <laughs> Maybe you're stepping into society, is that it? Now, there's a fine place for a grown-up man to be sitting. Gallagher, you'd make a wonderful corpse. I like to be around when it happens. 
Me too. Mr. Gallagher, would you care to have some dinner? No, thanks. I had a banana on the train. <laughs> Gallagher, is there anything special that you want? Well, Casey, I came over to give you the news. And sad news it is. Alderman Mahoney has passed on. Joe Mahoney dead? Oh, dear. That'll be a big wake. Tis a very sad case. There he was at the peak of his health with nothing wrong, except a bad heart. Then this morning he was walking down the street as spry as could be, and suddenly he stepped out, and his feet wasn't there. He was a good man, Mahoney. A good man. Of course he was a politician. And as such, undoubtedly, he had to do things that would keep an honest man awake at night. Oh, I've often wondered about Mahoney myself. May he rest in peace. After all, all I ever wanted from him was a simple little job in the Department of Sanitation. All Mahoney had to do to fix it for me was to say one little word. Do you ever say it? No. Why? Just because 11 years ago at the ward picnic, I dropped a lighted firecracker down his back. I never again trust a man who has no sense of humor. Gallagher, let you not speak ill of the dead. Mahoney was a good man. In spite of the fact that his wife had to leave him because he beat her up. Oh, you're right. He was a good man and an honest one. Although, do you remember there was a bit of a question as to what happened to the Democratic picnic funds? I never believed that Mahoney Stork took that money. And if he did, he needed it bad. I wonder who'll get Mahoney's job. Well, I can't imagine anyone else being Alderman. There's not a single man in the whole ward who could fill Mahoney's shoes. The Republicans may even get into the next election. Not a man in the ward. There is a man in the ward. The exact man to take Mahoney's place. He's honest and he's a good man. And he's probably the only man in the ward that every man, woman, and child knows and loves. And his name is Peter Casey. Now, nah, Maureen, that's what happens when a woman meddles in politics. The man you just mentioned is a thorough no good. Who? Oh. Of course, Pop. Why not? But I've never heard of anything so silly in all my life. That would give Pop something to do. And that's not a bad idea at all. <coughs> Casey for Alderman. Alderman Casey? Oh, no, no, no. Casey and politics don't go together. Pop, it's a wonderful idea. But it's going to take money. That's right, campaign funds. No, isn't that just like a woman to mention a non-essentials at a time like this? But I'm not running. It's silly. I'm not first in crookery and I wouldn't have a chance. Will the party back us? The first man in the Democratic Club to raise his voice against Casey has me to answer to. Pop, this city needs men like you. Honest, good men. And of course, there's something in that. Alderman Casey. I think we ought to have a drink to Alderman Casey. An idea. <coughs> and now to that good bottle of fine old Irish whiskey you've been holding out on us. And I know where it is. We'll drink a toast to Alderman Casey, the finest statesman in all the city. And who knows what'll come next? Maybe mayor. And then governor. And if he'd only been born in this country, we could make him president. No. I'll stop at Governor. Good evening, Miss Casey. We're not making too much noise again, are we? Oh, no. I'd like you to forget about that. What I've come to talk about is some tickets for the annual police ball. The proceeds, you know, go to the widows and orphans of policemen. And besides that... Well, we're pretty familiar with the police ball. Pop sold tickets to it for 25 years. Who is it, Maureen? An officer selling tickets to the police ball, Pop. Oh, bring him in. Let's see how he goes about it. Oh, some other time, Pop. We're at dinner and everything. No, no, bring him in. I want to see this. It's never too early to make friends, and every vote counts. Good evening, Mr. Casey. And what is it you want? Pop, I told you that... I've just called around, Mr. Casey, to sell you a few tickets for the policeman's ball. I thought that since you're so familiar with the purpose of the thing, that you might be more than willing to take a pair of tickets off my hands. And that's the way you're going about selling tickets, mealy mouth and fawning and licking at boots in your dumb scotch way? If everyone sells tickets like you, there'll be nobody at the ball but the orchestra. And the widows and orphans will starve to death. I realize I'm no very experienced at it, Mr. Casey, but I've already sold 138 tickets. And if I could persuade you to take a pair, it would make it a hundred and forty. Oh, oh, intimidation it is, is it? There you are, Gallagher, there you are. You see what the police force has come to? Going around threatening honest citizens with their lives to buy tickets. 
Well, I'll buy nothing from you or any other dumb Scotchman, and I'll show you that I'm not afraid of you or all the politicians running you. Now, Alderman, let me throw him through the door. No, let me tell him what I think of him first, Ferguson. When I'm elected Alderman, do you know what's going to happen to you? You'll be pounding a beat at the farthest point of Stanton Island, and I hope you walk off the end of one of them piers, which is a likely happening. For there never was a Scotchman yet who knew the beginning of one thing and the end of another. <laughs> Mr. Casey, will you never learn? Scotsman. And what's more, it's beneath the dignity of a Ferguson to sell tickets for even a dogfight to a cantankerous Irish Casey who can't pronounce a proper name properly. I'll be bidding you good night, sir. You'll be bidding me nothing, sir. Good. Why not even say good night to him? Oh, let me throw him through the door. Now, Mr. Gallagher, you behave yourself. I'll show him to the door. Well, I guess I told him. There was precious little we left out. Good night, Miss Casey. Mr. Ferguson. I'll take two tickets. If you'll come back for the money sometime when Pop isn't here. Well, that's very considerate of you, Miss Casey. But I wouldn't want you to get into any trouble with your father. Well, there won't be any trouble. And I'm sorry he flew off at you again. Oh, never mind that. I'm happy to sell you the tickets. And I'm glad you haven't got the money handy now. It'll be a fine excuse for me to come and see you again. Good night, Miss Casey. Good night. The one who's thrown it with both hands is none other than my opponent and fellow lodge member, Patrick Michael Raftery. Have you ever heard me say one word against Raftery? No! Have you ever heard me say one word against my opponent? No! All right, then hear me now. Understand now, my esteemed opponent, Patrick Michael Raftery, is a good man. But he's not a man of the people. No, 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 no. Furthermore, he's a politician and a tool of the interests. Understand, I haven't a thing to say against Raftery. But the man just hasn't got brains enough to hold public office. And that's why I say to you, if you want smart, honest government, if you want the greatest good for the greatest number in the war, Vote for Peter M. Casey! Yeah. In the words of Abraham Lincoln... Psst. Psst. You can fool some of the people. In the words of Abraham Lincoln... Well, you all know Abraham Lincoln and what a smart man he was. Well, that's what Raftery is trying to do to you. I thank you. Well, 
you've all heard your future alderman telling you what's what. Now, are there any questions? Oh, it is you, Callahan. What's it? Mr. Gallagher. Although Casey talked for quite a long while, and very well too, neither Casey nor yourself has yet explained to us just what his qualifications are for Alderman. Insubordination. Oh, wise guy, eh? Well, here at this headquarters, we have a way of taking care of troublemakers like yourself. Now, Gallagher. Oh, oh. stealing our cigars, eh? Taking them under false pretenses. Enough of that. Now, out you go. Gallagher. Out you go. Are there any other questions? The only thing that prevents my killing you is I can't find you. Are there any more questions? That old story about we Scots being a very close fist to the race is not true. Angus, I never said you were close fisted. That's true. But the other night when we were sitting in the top gallery at the theater, I could see you were thinking on the subject. Angus, I wasn't. Well, anyway, it's plain that a stingy man wouldn't go out and rent an automobile, even for a special occasion like this. Special occasion? Aye. Maureen, I should like very much to make you some bonny speeches. But in the first place, I have to drive the car. It's no mine, and I shouldn't have liked to smash it up. Secondly, I've rented the car by the hour. So I'd best get down to business and save something. It's only words. Maureen, I love you very dearly. And I want you to marry me. Angus, are you serious? Maureen, that's one thing an honest man doesn't fool about. Well, I suppose I should be coy and hold out for a while. But since I'm going to have some interest in your expenses, I'll save on words, too, and say yes. I was right. I knew you'd be a sensible lassie and see things with a sharp eye. Only I did always think I'd get kissed when I got proposed to. Ah, uh, but that would be a very brazen and dangerous performance in a moving car, especially when it's no yours. So, I'll kiss you as soon as we get to the justices. But Angus, what about Pop? Well, all I know is we never get anywhere asking him. So tonight we just get married, and then when we get ready to move into our own house, we'll tell him. It'll be one grand fight, and it'll all be over and done with. Mind you, we might have to wait a wee bit before we have our own home. Why? Well, I know a couple who aren't getting along very well. I think they'll be getting divorced soon. Then I'll be able to buy their furniture at a bargain. Oh. Mrs. Ferguson. Well, we must get married again sometime. I can hardly wait till the next time I see you. Well, soon you won't have to go home. It'll have to be terribly soon. If those two friends of mine don't hurry with their divorce, they'll find themselves stuck with their own furniture. But we'll not wait. I'll call his wife and tell her I'm one of his girlfriends. Maureen. Oh, darling. I was only kidding. We better say good night. Hey! I said good night. <laughs> Don't you?
you know that old custom about a man carrying his bride across the threshold? But darling, this isn't our threshold. Aye, that's true. But you must admit it's a good excuse for me to cuddle you in my arms again. But I said good night. I've got to hurry back with the automobile. Good night. Deceiving me you are. Pop, wait a minute. How many times have you been out with this... this immigrant? A lot. And he's no more of an immigrant than you are. What are you talking about? Ain't he a Scotchman fresh off the boat? But Pop, he was born in this country and raised in Scotland. And that makes him more of an American citizen than you are. Oh, that I should ever live to hear me own daughter compare me unfavorably with a Scotchman. Pop, it's about time you got it straight that in this country there isn't any room for... for interracial feuds. Everyone in this country is either an immigrant or descended from one, unless he's an Indian. Glory be, the child's been listening to them radicals. I haven't been listening to anyone but you, Pop. And you've always been hounding me to find a boyfriend. Well, I find one and look what happens. But, Maureen, darling, don't you see, as daughter of the next alderman, you can't afford to be seen out with a Scotchman. There, we're off on that again. Now, if you have any respect for your old father, you'll never let me see you with that Scotchman again. I'll get you a young man. Nice young man. Now off to bed with you. We both lost enough sleep over this. Good night, Pop. Good night, Clara. Take it easy, Pop. Take it easy. Even at four o'clock in the morning, a man can't get into his own bathroom. Apple pie is good, Michael. You should taste a bit of the strawberry pie Marine makes. Man, it would make your mouth water just to think of it. Now, Pop, the way you're building me up to Mr. Flaherty, he'll be thinking I ought to have a chef's job at the Waldorf. And so you should, child, so you should. It was a very nice dinner. Thanks. Oh, dear, now what do you think of this? Here are tickets for the show tonight that I clean forgot all about. Imagine me doing a thing like that. Oh. Michael. Maybe you and Maureen would like to go. It's a fine show, I hear. But, Mr. Casey, I thought we were going to work on one of your speeches tonight. Well, now, as a matter of fact, there's something I must do at headquarters. We'll do our work some other night. Here you are now. Hurry along. Hurry along, or you'll be too late for the show. But, Pop, I have to do the dishes, and then I'd have to change clothes now, and everything. Now, now, none of that. Now, none of that. Pat and Mac will do the dishes. And your own dress, the one you have on, is quite beautiful enough. Hurry along now, and don't be bothering me. Go but, on. We'll do them. Yeah, we'll do them. Eat your pie, young man. Eat your pie. Hurry along now. Miss Casey, I assure you, I don't mean to impose on you like this. I'm afraid it's I who's imposing on you.
Miss Casey, I had a very nice evening. Thanks, I did too. Tell your father to call me any other night that he wants me. Yes, I will. Good night. Good night. Oh, Miss Casey. Remember me to your sister, please. Which one? Well, the beautiful one, of course. Well, I mean Eloise. I will. This is your car, I suppose? That's right, officer. Have you ever heard tell of the city ordinance relating to parking too near a fire plug? Yes, but I'm sorry I didn't see it. Aye, that's the trouble with motorists. Too many people don't see things. Have your driver's license. Dennis Michael Flaherty. Michael Dennis Flaherty. Hmm. Yeah. Part two near a fire plug. Rear license plate improperly lighted. Parked too far from the curb. Registration card and driver's license made out to different addresses. Now listen, officer. All of those things are merely technicalities. All I ask you, is it the law or is it no the law? Yes, it is, but that's all I want to know. There you are, young Lorcan Var. And let that be a lesson to you. I never thought you'd be that small. Well, I'm sorry, but it's no very satisfactory. Me being married one day and seeing my wife outweigh another man the next. Well, we couldn't help it. Pop forced us both into the date. As a matter of fact, he went completely overboard for Eloise. Oh, all right. But I can't bear to see her outweigh any other man. It's very disconcerting. Why, Angus? You're jealous. Aye, that I am. Show me a Ferguson and I'll show you a jealous man. Well, I like you to be jealous if you don't go around arresting everybody. I'll try not to. But sometimes I get terribly tired sneaking around side streets and in dark corners trying to see you. Do you know something? I'm going to start wheeling your father to my side. Help him in his campaign. Talk up some votes for him. That might help. And Maureen, I've got some real good news for you. What is it? You remember that married couple I told you about? Yeah. Well, I heard this very day that the end is near. No. Aye. The husband was away from home for two whole days, and when he got back, the wife flung a rooster at him, and it was one of their wedding presents, no less. No. Aye. Just wait till you see their parlor furniture. My, I hope they don't damage it in one of their fights. <laughs> Oh, Angus. Oh. Keep the situation well in hand, Ferguson. My beak was never like this. <laughs> Casey. He's back there with the chin. Oh. And I always say, show me an Irishman and I'll show you the coward. What's that? I says, show me an Irishman and I'll show you the coward. Well, I'm an Irishman. Well, I'm a coward. Oh, yeah, you are, are you? You little dumb a dog. Now, Gallagher! Gallagher, don't do that! Don't do that! Are you with him? Not me. Is there anybody else? Well, let him alone. He's all wet. <laughs> Jason, I've been having a terrible time trying to get a hold of my friend Farley. You know, Roosevelt's going to have a fireside chat tomorrow night, and I think I can get you a boost on the program. If we don't get some more money for this campaign, there's going to be no need for Mr. Roosevelt or anyone else to mention me. Bills, bills, bills. No money to pay them with, and all our credit gone. We might try to get some money from our friends. Why have you been standing me up lately? Oh, I haven't been standing you up, Joe. 
It's just that I've been busy nights, helping Pop with his campaign. How's it going? Well, not so good right now. We need money and we don't know where to get it. A man like your father shouldn't have much trouble getting campaign money. There ought to be a lot of guys, respectable citizens, who'd be glad to kick in. Maybe there are, but we don't seem to be able to find them. Would it boost my stock in your eyes if I was able to raise a little cash for your old man's campaign fund? Joe, could you? I think maybe you could be arranged, honey. If money's all your old man needs, you're practically an alderman's daughter. And our next alderman, Peter M. Casey. <laughs> On who? What's the matter with you? You got wax in your ears? You heard what I said. And our next alderman, Peter M. Casey. <laughs> you mean on John Nicholas, don't you? Oh, you said it. What's John Nicholas got to do with it? Ah, oh, don't be giving me that guff, Gallagher. You know that Nicholas has been slipping Casey campaign money. Now, for that, I'm going to take and ram you down in your shoes and squeeze you out the lace hole. And he can do it. Hold on, Gallagher. Amos, you've been listening to Raftery and his scandalous lies. Hear me now, Casey, my buckle. Politicians don't have to tell lies about each other. The truth is bad enough. On what information do you base what you say? And if it isn't the truth you tell us, I'd take your right arm and tear it out of its socket and beat you over the head with it like a club. You can do that. No, Casey. I'm only saying what I heard. It hurt me here, Casey. And what did you hear? Well, I heard that your daughter, Heloise, had been going around with John Nicholas, and he raised the money. Now, understand, Casey, I'm not claiming this to be an out-and-out -out fact. I'm only saying what I heard. But when I seen your daughter going around with a good-for-nothing lover, Nicholas, it seemed to make sense. What else did they say? And they say that Johnny's friends is going to use you as a Charlie McCarthy and keep things around the ward sewed up so tight nobody will ever bother him. And just for saying that, I'm going to take the boot of your ears and tear them from your head as though they were tissue paper so that you won't be able to hear any of the things that are going And on. he can do it. Never mind that, Gallagher. Come on, let's find out about this. Come in. What's the matter, Pop? Eloise. There's a nasty rumor going around the ward, and I've got to find out whether it's true or not. Tell me, darling, where did you get the 2500 you gave me for the campaign fund? Why, from businessmen. What businessmen? Name one. Well, uh... Joe Nicholas, maybe? Well, yes, Pop, but... Oh. There ain't any butts taking money from Joe Nicholas. That's a thing a man either does or he doesn't. Well, Pop, I was only trying to help you. We needed money so badly, and, and Joe said he'd be glad to... And what are you doing running around with Joe Nicholas? How many times have I told you to stay away from that hoodlum? Well, Pop, he can show you a good time because he's got money and... Sure, he has money. And how does he get it? by breaking the law. And the reason he gave me money was because he thought when I became alderman, I'd help him break the law. You put me in a fine spot, Eloise. And it's a fine pass my family's come to. One of my daughters running around with a hoodlum, another sneaking out with a Scotchman, and only one interested in a good Irish boy. He doesn't have any brains. Oh, I'm sorry, Pop. I thought I was doing the right thing. You've shamed me, Eloise. You've shamed me in a way I never thought one of my daughters would shame me. I can't return the money. It's all paid out or pledged. Well, boys, it's true. Oh, if we'd only that money. I'd take and I'd jam it down Nicholas' throat with me fist at the end of it. You can do that. Come along, boys. Let's find this John Nicholas. Hold on, Gallagher. Have you seen John Nicholas? Yes, I can. Oh. Looking for me, boys? Yes. 
I'm looking for you, Nicholas. You know why, or if you don't, you ought to. Sit down, have a drink. Now, there's an idea. I'm not drinking with the likes of you. Just because you happen to sneak some money into my possession is no reason to suppose I'd sit down at the same table with you. All right, Casey, hold your trousers. Don't be giving the next alderman orders, or I'd take the two fingers of my left hand and pull your teeth out one by one. Wisdom teeth and all. I just wanted to tell you, Nicholas, I can't return your money. It's all spent. In that event, it's easy to make noises like an honest man, isn't it, Casey? Now, one more crack like that out of you, Nicholas, and I take your head and bend it backwards and it breaks off at the hips. And he can do it. Peter M. Casey would never be beholden to the likes of you. If being an alderman means I'd have to listen to you without throwing you out of my office, I want no part of it. Now, listen, boys. Your next alderman is going to make a little talk. Come on, let's get out of here. Be quiet. Gentlemen, I've come to speak to you in sadness. I have a confession to make. A confession I never thought I'd have to make to my friends. It's with great shame that I have to tell you I'm not a fit man to run for elective office. Much as I'd like to represent you in city council, I can't. I've taken money from a source that no honest man could stomach. And in doing so, I fixed myself so that no decent man could vote for the likes of me. I resent those remarks, Casey. Ganlon, you keep out of this. I will not keep out of it. I've known Peter Casey, 40 years, man and boy, and I never knew him to do anything that was bad. Now, if there's such a thing as an honest politician, Casey is it. You're wrong, Scanlon, you're wrong. I'm a skunk and a no-gooder, and I'm in the pay of the criminal interest. Now, you're not telling the truth, and all your friends know it. Will you hush your fuss? If Casey says he's a skunk, don't be disputing of his word. Oh, oh, right. Right. Right That's why I say to all of you, don't vote for me. Vote for Raftery. At least they haven't caught him yet. Now, pay no attention to this man. He's either drunk or out of his mind. A vote for Casey is a vote for honest government. Hey! Um, anyone who votes for after him, well, he deserves it. Gentlemen, uh, uh, you're an interfering fool and I'm not going to be tossed up by you. Casey's a crook. I never said I was a crook. Good evening to you. I always thought I'd have the pleasure of throwing you out of somewhere. to do. Out of my way! Ooh. You were charged with vacancy. How do you plead? Guilty. 30 days. Next case. Peter Casey, Michael Scanlon. Peter, I never expected to find you here. This is not my doing, Eddie. I, I mean, Your Honor. Forty years an honest citizen, and it takes this Scotchman here to bring me a foul of the law. Well, Peter, it says here that you and Mr. Scanlon disrupted the peace, and that you were responsible for a riot during which several men were injured. What have you to say to that? Now, Your Honor, I'll tell you how it was. Scanlon here and myself were having a peaceful conversation about politics in which some of the boys joined in. Well, I'll admit the talk got a little warm at time, and there was an exchange of words back and forth. You know how it is when men begin to talk about politics. 
Now, into this peaceful gathering comes this pinchpenny here, looking for fight and using his uniform to intimidate honest citizens. Well, Your Honor, after all, we're free men. So we stood up to him. When all of a sudden he begins to swing right and left, I was amazed. I said, is the man gone mad? Why, my poor friend Gallagher, who is as soft a spoken man as you'd ever meet in your life, didn't have a chance to open his mouth. Mm -hmm. Patrolman Ferguson, as the arresting officer in the case, what have you got to say about this? Well, Your Honor, it seems I misjudged the situation. What Mr. Casey says is probably correct. And I'm very sorry if I've caused the defendants or the court any inconvenience. Now, there you are, Your Honor. You see what happens when you have a Scotchman on the police force? Here's a man, an officer of the law, who perjures himself in a court of justice. The fact of the matter is this. Scanlon here and myself were having a fight as to whether or not I'm a skunk, which I am, and no decent man should vote for me. We should have been hauled in. Your Honor, those are not exactly the facts. It was a very quiet affair. And I'd have taken no notice of it, had it not been for... A the noise and the chair crashing through the plate glass window. So that's the way you do your duty, is it? You rightly arrest a man, and then because you think I'm going to be the next alderman and maybe do you some good, you try to bootlick me here in an open court. <coughs> well, uh, don't you think this matter could be settled privately? No, Your Honor, we'll settle it here right now. And let me tell you this. As I pointed out before, as an officer, you're a disgrace to the whole force. And I don't want any Scotchman, much less a bad Scotchman, hanging around my daughter. Is that plain? Scotsman. Mr. Casey, I've told you time and time again. But maybe your skull is too thick to ken so simple a fact. If I was 15 years younger? If I was 10 years young? Oh, my hat, scan, then I'd have it out with him. Well, now, wait a minute, Peter. We'll hey, try... More because of your previous good record than because of any facts presented here, I find you and Scanlon not guilty. Thank you, Eddie. I mean, Your Honor. Let this be a lesson to you. Nice case. Maureen, I'm sorry. Maureen! That you come away from this Scotchman before you begin to look like him. As for you, Maureen, we won't go into that Scotchman anymore. If I come in contact with him again, I'll go to court, all right. But it won't be for just disturbing the peace this time. And there's not a jury in the country that would convict me. Now, who the devil is ringing the doorbell at this hour of the night? It's Angus. Do you think people would have more sense than to come visiting when a... Angus? Now, Pop, take it easy. Mr. Casey, I thought it best to come here and settle this matter once and for all. I'll have no talk with you, Scotchman. If you value your skin, you'll get out of this house two jumps quicker than you came in. Now, don't get excited. I'll go, but no until I've said what I've come to say. I've never been one to do things in an underhand way. And I've just come to tell you that I'm no going to stop seeing Maureen. So, you'll cause my daughter to disobey her father's wishes. Is that it? Mr. Casey, that time has never come. When a man could be told that he's no permitted to see his own wife, now take that and think about it. I think about nothing. I'm through with thinking. At this moment... Wife? Who's your wife? I am, Pop. When were you married? Maureen, when did it happen? Mr. Casey, I want you to understand that we wouldn't have done it this way had it no been... Maureen! Pack up your things and leave this house. But, Pop, we were going to tell you in another way that There's it... nothing to be said! You have a husband now. Let you go at home. But, Pop, it isn't... A... I said pack up your things and leave! As far as I'm concerned, I have only two daughters now. Oh, now, Pop, wait a minute. Pops, you don't mean that. Good night, Pat. Good night, Eloise. Maureen, really it will. Maureen, Pop, 
I'll get over it. And so I say to you, under the circumstances, a vote for me is a vote for dishonest government. What? 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 That's the loud and the sharp. And my husband says that if Casey is honest enough to admit that, he'll make an honest alderman. And now, knowing what you know about me, if I catch any of you voting for me, I know what it's for, and it won't do you no good. So that is for you. Me, I don't pay no attention to what Casey says about himself. If someone else was saying it about him, I'd listen. Eight pounds. For Alderman, 28 precincts give Peter Casey 19,428. Patrick Raftree, 4,863. Why anyone would vote for me, I don't know. If the fools elect me, Barnum was right. Yeah? Yeah. Raftree's done what? We're in. Raftree's conceded the election. I don't understand it. I did everything in my power to keep from being elected. Oh, what are you talking about? Now's the time when every good man needs a drink in Casey. I hope you'll not be forgetting a little job in the department of sanitation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, unaccustomed as I am to public drinking, I'm going to do a little toast to our new alderman, Peter M. Casey. <laughs> a man has ever graced the city hall, and since there isn't enough to go all the way around, I'd take a drink for the lot of you. Ah! Hold everything, folks. Clear the way. We're going to take a picture of his honor. Keep the girls with you, Mr. Casey. I'd like to make this a little family group. Is this all right? Well, yes, except, is the man in backy or one of the family? Well, we all come over in the same boat. Oh, get out of there, Gallagher. Don't interfere with the press in the pursuit of his duties. Oh. No, Gallagher. Being as we were married to sisters, let bygones be bygones. Have a cigar. <coughs> well? What? A match! That was it all right. Well, yes, Mr. Casey, but I was told to get a picture of you and your three daughters. Haven't you got another girl? You're mistaken. I have only two daughters. Oh, and you! Get them doors open! Merry Christmas, Mr. Casey. Merry Christmas, you, sir. Merry Christmas, Alderman. Merry Christmas, Mrs. McGill. And who are you, ma'am? Oh, oh, Maggie. Here's a little something for the children. Oh, thanks. <laughs> hey! Casey! Merry Christmas, Gallagher! Hiya, Popsy! Hello, Pop. Hello. You do dabs I bought. Merry Christmas, Mr. Casey. Thank you, and a Merry Christmas to you, Michael. And to you, Mac. Merry Christmas. Well, have you heard? Is everybody coming to the party tonight? Gallagher called three times to say he'd be here. I know, I know. Well, we need a bit of new furniture anyway. <laughs> Get it, will you, Pat? Got it. Merry Christmas, this is Pat. Oh. oh hello, Angus. Yeah. Yes. Oh, thanks, Angus. Now, now, don't worry about anything. <laughs> Who is it, Pat? Angus. Oh. Well, I hope you told him there's no one in this family who wants to hear a Merry Christmas from him. He just took Maureen to the hospital. Hospital? Hospital? Uh, Pat. You think we've got enough bread for that gang that's coming tonight? She's been run over, ain't she? No. I'm not as worried about the bread as I am the meats and cheese. You know that bunch. The, the... What kind of daughters have I? Your own sister lying at death's door in the hospital and you talk about a party. Oh, calm down, Pop. She'll be all right. You haven't been interested all these months, so don't get yourself in a stew now. Hey, Elvis, how about getting another cake for The that? devil take the cake and those who are going to eat it. What's happened to Maureen? She's going to have a baby. Oh. Hmm. 
Really? I don't see where that's any concern of mine. Thousands of women all over the country are having babies this very day. A hundred years from now, no one will know the difference. Okay, Paul, let's not say anything more about it. No. Why shouldn't I say something about it with my daughter in the hospital going to have a baby? You know, Mr. Casey, someday I'll have a baby. <laughs> I'd like to be there when it happens. You will. Why wasn't I told about this before? Am I a stranger in my own house that I don't know it when my own daughter goes to the hospital? What hospital? St. Mark's. Oh. I just happen to remember. I have an errand to run for a constituent of mine who lives down that way. And if I have time, I'll drop in the hospital on my way back. Or maybe I'll drop into the hospital first, then go on the errand afterwards. Well, anyway, I, I, I'll do one or the other, and whichever one I do, I, 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 well, I know, I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> What have they done with her? Where have they taken her? Mrs. Ferguson has gone to the delivery room. Oh, hello, Pop. I knew you'd be here. And you knew more than I did. I was just passing and I happened to hear that Maureen was here. So I dropped in to see that all was well. Oh, miss, I'd like to know. Excuse me. Could you tell me? Excuse me. I'd like to know. Excuse me. Well, you don't talk to people around here. You just interrupt them. No. No, don't worry, Pop. Everything will be all right. <laughs> Let me see. Let me see my grandchild. You, Clonopy. You are Scotch, aren't you? I. Oh dear, that this should be happening to my little girl. Now, Pop, didn't the doctor just say? That Maureen's a fine, healthy lassie, and that she's meeting everything bravely as it comes. Calm yourself. Calm myself? How can I calm myself with my own little girl in there having happening to her? What's happening to her? Now, Pop, look, it's all right. What did you say? I said, now look, Pop. Why, man? I've been saying it to you for an hour. I wouldn't care if you'd been saying it all your life. If it weren't a national emergency, I wouldn't be here at all. I've been walking for hours. I just got off my beat before I came here. Well, don't complain to me. I didn't ask you to become a policeman. Maureen and I were talking about what we'd name him if he was a wee boy. We decided on Peter Casey Ferguson. And if it's a girl... Don't talk nonsense. It'll be a boy. Peter Casey Fergus. I never thought I'd live to hear a combination of words like that. Pop! Well? Oh, Pop. What are you doing here, leaving the party and all? Is this the way the Casey Street their guests? Gallagher's there. I don't like the tone of voice he says that in. What of it? Oh, nothing much. I tried to play the piano and it wouldn't play. And then we found out Gallagher had put little Mr. Callahan inside of it. It's not bad. Couple of days in bed and he'll be as good as new. Is this the Ferguson party? Why? It is not. It's the Casey party. Well, what's going on? It's a girl. Pops! Pop. Are you sure you haven't made a mistake? Oh, you Scotchman. I knew you'd disappoint me. I had nothing to do with it, being a girl. And you with your three daughters should be the last to complain. But Mr. Casey... Don't go defending him. The first time in my life I'm a grandfather and look what happens. But Mr. Casey... Don't interrupt. 
I knew no good would come of this. A girl. Excuse me, but there's also a boy. And Mrs. Ferguson had twins. Congratulations! Oh, 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 you know, I knew it. I knew me old little girl would never disappoint me. <laughs> well, it's an old Scottish custom, but it seems that the father should come in for some congratulations. Thank you, Gatsa, Mary Angus. Well, fella, congratulations. Yes. What a big boy that is now. Uh, here, Peter. let me hold him too. There. There, there you are. Their mother will have plenty of time to cuddle them later on. Pops, take it easy. There we are. There we are. Oh, no. <laughs> the boy's gonna be a college man. No policeman in this family. Why, what's the matter with the policeman? Their grandfather is a policeman. Their father's a policeman. At least he's on the force. And if this baby goes to college, he'll go to police college. Aye, but only if he wants to. He'll want to. I'll say to that, you, you Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Scotsman. Who married you two? We were married by a justice. Oh, ho! Oh.